Hey guys, what's going on? Thanks for joining me today. My name is Mark, this is Spagabber Backpacking, and we are doing a beginner backpacking series. This is video number two, where we'll be covering clothing. So we're gonna start out, we're gonna talk about some general things about clothing you should take or wear while you're out backpacking. And kind of the, uh, the methodology that goes into how you select clothing, the different places you could go to get that clothing, and different functions for different pieces of gear. Then I will show some of the examples of what it is I use. So why don't we get this thing going? All about clothing today, so let's go. Let's do this. Thanks for coming back. We're going to get this thing going, talking all about clothing today, the clothing you should be wearing or taking while you're going out on your backpacking trip. So for the beginner, this can be one that uh, is sometimes overthought, but other times not thought about quite enough. So the key to it is you have to understand the area that you're in and the area you will be backpacking or hiking in. So understanding that, knowing the climate, knowing what kind of weather conditions are, are going on, knowing how cold it could get or how hot it could get, knowing whether or not you will be under tree cover or out in a wide open desert or field or prairie type environment, those are all keys that you need to know and understand before you decide what type of stuff you're going to wear. Clothing is, in general terms, it is best done if you use a layering system. So it's better to use lots or more thinner, smaller layers than it is to just use one big, thick, heavy layer. So the reason for that is that you want the ability to modulate the internal temperature. You want the ability to shed layers when you start getting hot or put on more layers as you start to cool off. You do not want to sweat in your clothing that you're backpacking in, especially in a colder environment. Now, in a hot environment, it's inevitable. You are going to sweat in your clothes. That's just, it's a given. So like I was saying, you are going to sweat if you are out in summertime. That's, that's not a question. You're gonna sweat. But what you don't wanna do is go out in a cold environment and start sweating. Because then, if your clothes get wet, the wind picks up, hypothermia is a huge, huge issue you have to deal with. Now, people think hypothermia only happens in the cold environments. Actually, I would say research shows that it is actually most common on those cooler fall or spring days when people aren't quite as prepared for the elements. And so they get out, they sweat a little bit, they get onto an exposed section, maybe a ridge or just out into an exposed field with a good wind, and that wind really robs them of their internal body temperature. The, the wet or cold clothing just kind of strips off all of that heat, and so that's something that you want to pay attention to. So, like I said, layering is important. Carrying extra layers. There are, there are base layers, there are external layers, there are wind layers, there is rain protection. We're gonna discuss all of those today. Okay, there are a lot of different fabrics that you can get clothing in. So, I'm wearing cotton right now. Is this appropriate for backpacking? Well, there's a saying that cotton kills. Do I agree with that? Not entirely, but I know where it comes from. So, cotton retains water. It doesn't wick water away from the skin, and so it keeps you colder, clammier, it gets heavier, it does not dry quickly, and it does not insulate well. It especially does not insulate well when it's wet. So those are things you have to really keep in mind when you're picking your fabrics. So there are lots of different fabrics out there. The ones that are most often used when out backpacking are wools. So merino wool is a, a big one. Uh, in the past, wool has kind of been looked down upon because it does to some people have an itchy, not so nice against the skin feel. However, the current merino wool, wools and merino wool and blend wool blends uh, really are nice fabrics and 
to me, feel pretty good against the skin. Uh, great thing about wool, well, a few things. One, it's natural. Two, is that it, uh, it doesn't retain smell and it still insulates when wet. So those are three big things uh, that I like about wool. Wool stands up pretty well to use, but it can be expensive. So that's something that's a downside. Then you have nylons and polyesters. A lot of the backpacking, hiking material out there that's used in pants, undergarments, jackets, shirts, are of the nylon or polyester material. They're lightweight. They're, uh, they don't breathe as well as a wool, but they can be made very breathable. They also um, tend to wick away sweat very well. The big downside that I have with a lot of the synthetics is that they stink quickly. So one day out on the trail and you smell like a through hiker. Uh, so that's one of the things with the synthetics, the polyester and nylons, is that they, they really do hold the smell. And once the smell is in there, has permeated the material, it doesn't take much for that smell to come back out. So there's that one. Uh, it does dry very quickly. So if you're wearing something that is a polyester or a nylon and you get to camp, uh, you can take it off air it out in the sun. The UV actually does help the, the smell, but the UV can break down the fabric a little bit as well. So lots of gives and takes there. But it is, it is usually readily available. You can find it lots of different places. It's, it can range in price from very cheap to extremely expensive depending on the make, the fabric, the different additives that are in it. Uh, but it is what most people use out there. Then you have silks. So silk is a, a fabric that is luxurious, feels nice against the skin. However, it doesn't breathe well and it does not pull away moisture. It does not wick moisture very well. It is, however, comfortable and warm. And so it is a great, very compactable too. Very, very compactable. Uh, it's a great base layer for sleep systems. So it's a good one to have in your pack so that when you get to camp, it's something luxurious to change into and keep you warm at camp. And then we already kind of hit on cotton. It's, uh, it's comfortable. It does not pack down well. It does not retain heat well, especially when wet. It does not dry quickly. But if you are using it simply as a camp item, realize it's gonna be heavier to pack it in but if you want that comfort for when you're at camp, absolutely go for it. And although there is the saying that cotton kills, if you look back and see what Grandma Gatewood or uh, some of the, the pioneers of backpacking, the pioneers of hiking, what they wore, it was a lot of cottons and wools and burlaps. So to say that cotton kills a lot of people and I do mean a lot of people have successfully hiked, backpacked, been out in the backcountry using cotton, and they were just fine. But beware, there are better options out there. So let's take a look at some of these options. Okay, so let's get into some of the clothing that I use when I go out, starting with underwear. So underwear is really important. You want something that's going to wick away moisture. You want something that's going to dry rather quickly. And you want something that's going to prevent chafing. So this is probably the only area across the spectrum where it is different for men and women. Now, there are, there are a lot of differences, a lot of uh, ways that people can go about it. You know, some people, well, some people like to go commando. And that's, that's definitely an option, a way that you can do it. Uh, other people use pants or shorts that have built-in liners, and that's the way they go. But for most women, they use either Patagonia or Ex Officio makes some brief type underwear uh, that they use. And then for tops, rather than using anything like an underwire bra, a sports bra, and it doesn't have to be anything expensive, anything extravagant, 
I know a lot of people just go to a Target or a Walmart and buy something off the shelf there, and that works just fine. Uh, other people go with more expensive ones, like an Under Armour type deal. Uh, so let's get into what I'm using. So I have three, three, three different types of underwear that I will use. So I've got uh, just some, some boxer briefs from Patagonia, and those work really well. I've got some smart wool ones, and these ones, while they're a little bit thicker and don't seem to breathe quite as well as my Patagonia ones or the other ones I'm going to show you, they do a great job of not smelling. They don't stink. Because they're made of merino wool, they don't stink, which is nice. And my favorite pair, I've got a few pairs of these. These are Under Armour. They're the Iso Chill Mesh and they wick away moisture really really well this was the first pair i found that i didn't chafe at all with and so these ones are kind of a go-to for me now moving on the next piece is socks so socks i only use merino wool and darn tough makes great socks the cool thing about darn tough they're made out of Vermont, but they come with a lifetime guarantee. If you ever wear through a pair, a lot of times on the heels is where a lot of people will wear through. If you ever wear through, a, wear through a pair of these, simply send them back and they will send you a brand new pair. They are guaranteed for life. Now, I used to use these ones, the shorter ones, uh, three quarter length or whatever, whatever they're called, you know, this length quite a bit, pretty much extensively, um, and I used to hike a lot in shorts. With the problems I've had recently with ticks, I have moved to longer socks. And so, again, darn tough, but these are the ones I'm using now. So they are full length, pull up ones, and I went with the lighter color because the lighter color tends to attract insects a little bit less. What insects like to find is a, a distinct line between skin and something else. And usually it's a dark line because you're wearing darker clothes than your skin. And so they find that and that's what they go for. So I've gone with these lighter color ones and uh, that's what I use. Now all of my socks are treated with permethrin except for the ones I save for camp. So I have this pair, which is my camp pair. Uh, it is a thicker pair of smart wool socks. And they're merino. I don't use these a lot in the summertime. In the summertime, I will use something a little bit thinner. But for camp and for in my sleeping bag or in my quilt, I really like having a nice, luxurious pair of socks. And these ones, this, this one's inside out, so you can see the the wool is really piled well and uh, and so it gives a lot of loft there which keeps my feet warm and is pretty luxurious and pretty nice. Uh, so let's move on from the underwear to talk a little bit about base layers. Alright, next we're going to get into the base layers. So this is the layer that goes between your underwear and whatever you're wearing on the outside or where I mostly use it is sleeping. So I almost always take some sort of base layer to sleep in, in all but the hottest of nights. And the reason is I like to keep the dirt and the grime and the oils that are on me, my skin, my hair, off of my quilts as much as possible because I use down quilts and I wanna keep the loft of the quilts alive. And the more oil and grime that gets in to the quilts, it will compress those the down and it won't work as well until it gets cleaned. So, two different systems I use, I, and I've actually got several different setups, but the two that I use most often, one is a very lightweight and it is right here. This is the Patagonia Capilene Lightweight. It is long sleeve, long pants, and they're, they're very, very thin a very thin material but they are very effective they pack down really well they're really light 
and they're really effective at keeping in heat. Now, for those colder trips, I like to take something like this Under Armour. And what's nice about this Under Armour, it's inside out right now so that you can see this, but it has this grid pattern. And that grid pattern, uh, a lot of different companies out there use a grid type pattern like this, the micro grid. The outside is pretty smooth. You can probably see right here, it's pretty smooth on the outside, uh, but that grid on the inside is soft. And because of those little channels between the pieces of, of fleece, uh, it traps it in heat really, really well. So like I said, I've got that, both the top and the bottom. And for the colder trips, uh, I'll use this. Now, you can see just from holding these two, this one, while it's warmer and is going to keep me warmer, it doesn't pack down nearly as well. This one is much more lightweight, much more compressible. Um, and so make sure when you're doing it, you're carrying what you need. All right, so now that we've got underwear and base layer out, let's just figure out what it is day to day that I'm hiking in. Let's start with pants. Okay, so for bottoms, sometimes I will wear pants and sometimes I will wear shorts. It kind of depends on the trip. If I'm gonna be walking through bushes, if I'm gonna be doing anything off trail, if I'm gonna be doing anything really thick bugs, I like to use full long pants. And so I've got something like, like these. These are North Face and they're full length. Now, what I like about these is that they have a stretch to them. Uh, and not all of them out there have a stretch, but if you can find some that have a stretch, a lot of the newer ones do have a stretch. They tend to be more comfortable to move in. I also have a pair that's just nylon, and these have no stretch, no give to them. So I have to get these a little bit baggier, a little bit looser, uh, in order to still provide the mobility to move around in. Now, the difference between this pair of pants and this pair of pants, other than the stretch, is this, this zipper right here. These are convertible pants. So you can see right here, just above the knee, there is a zipper that goes all the way around. And so you can zip them off, and so these are convertible pants. These can be used both as pants or as shorts, which gives them a lot of flexibility and a lot of um, adaptability to the situation you're in. If you're gonna be bushwhacking one day and out in just an open on rocks or whatever the next day and you don't need that coverage, you can zip them off, pack the, the pant legs, and use shorts and have a little bit more breathability, a little bit more air circulation around your legs. Now, if you know you're gonna be in an area where you don't have to worry about ticks, if you don't have to worry about anything up against you or you just don't care, you're gonna be using bug spray, you're gonna be making sure that your legs are taken care of and you just like to hike in shorts, there are a lot of different ones out there. So this pair is nylon and it's just a, a short, a pair of shorts. Uh, now it has has pockets in there, has, has a really nice pocket here that my phone fits down in, uh, but they're just nice, breathable nylon shorts and they dry extremely quickly. Very lightweight. This pair is Arc'teryx and they just dry really, really nicely. Now I also have, this is actually a pair of running shorts that I got from Patagonia and what I like about these, they have, they do have an inner liner and so I won't use underwear when I'm using these shorts. This inner liner on this pair of shorts is nice because it actually has a microbial or an antimicrobial uh, stitching or something sewn into it that prevents the smell. So these actually work really well at preventing smells. Uh, and it has some, some zippered pockets, so if you were to use the pockets, all the pockets have zippers on them, which is nice. And the final thing, this has the elastic waistband with a drawstring. And what's nice about this drawstring is the drawstring is on the outside. So you can actually cinch it up and tie it and not have to worry about tucking it inside. It's not uncomfortable when you have your hip belt over it. So those are just some things to think about. But this pair is not nylon. It's actually a polyester and it has stretch to it as well. So those are just some different options that you could go with for bottoms. Let's look at what I wear on my tops.
Okay, so upper body, uh, I want something that's gonna breathe pretty well, that is comfortable, and I pay a little bit of attention to the seams. Because I've got the backpack on, I don't always like seams that are on the shoulders because your backpack shoulder strap is gonna be going over that. If you can find them with a seam here and then a seam a little bit further down and not right on top, I tend to like that a little bit better. This one is just like that. So this is a Mountain Hardware shirt and you can see the seam is not right at the top on the front or the back. And so it goes over your shoulder. So my shoulder would be in there and the top doesn't have a seam on it. What I dislike about this one, this is a polyester fabric. It's very comfortable. It's, uh, it's not super lightweight, but it's not, it's not heavy. But what I dislike about this one is after about three hours in it, it smells. Uh, and it seems every time I go out, it smells more. So something to be aware of when you're picking fabrics. A lot of synthetics go that way. I just recently got this one. This is a Patagonia and it is very, very thin. Uh, it is extremely thin. But I wanted something very lightweight for summertime. And so this is a Capilene cool, lightweight, super fast drying. Uh, with it being as thin as it is, you guys can probably see my hand through there. With it being as thin as it is, it's going to dry very, very quickly. And super lightweight, super packable, and comfortable. So look for something that's comfortable. Comfort is going to be first priority. Uh, you're going to be hiking in it all day long. Something that wicks, something that breathes, and something that's comfortable. Those are the things you really want to look for. Now, I talked about the brands that I've got. Mountain Hardware, North Face, Patagonia, Arcteryx. These things are not, uh, most of these aren't available at your local sporting goods store. But that doesn't mean that what they have, or even a Target or a Walmart, isn't sufficient. A lot of them, you can go in, I know that Frozen, Frozen who is currently out doing an Appalachian Trail through hike, is using gear, uh, some of his clothing, actually most of his clothing I believe, is Champion or Russell brand clothing that he bought at I believe Target or Walmart. Very cheap and still performs pretty well. I think it's like the C9 stuff is what he really prefers. So there are options out there to get into performance type clothing. I know that they have underwear. Uh, Hanes has some underwear. There are a lot of different companies out there that make them and make them more affordable. Now I will say you do get what you pay for to some extent. It's going to smell quicker. It's going to um, probably break down a little bit quicker than some of the ones that are purpose built for backpacking for the outdoors, but not bad options. If you want to use just like running shorts or just athletic shorts, absolutely you can do that. If you just want to wear, you know, just some pants that you find, some warm up tracksuit pants or something, you can do that. You can wear whatever you want. Let's move on to the next layer of this system and talk about that. Okay, next up, we're gonna deal with insulated layers. So what you'll notice is that I primarily only use insulated layers on my upper body. As long as I keep my upper body warm, with the hiking, the lower body stays warm. Once I get to camp, I will put on my, uh, my insulative base layer and that'll take care of the legs. But for the most part, when I'm out hiking, I'm staying nice and warm. And as long as I can keep my upper body warm. And so what I'll use is something like some sort of fleece. So this is a Patagonia R1. It's a uh, little half zip. It's got a little chest pocket there. And it's nice and comfortable and nice and warm. And with that zipper, I can regulate temperature somewhat while I'm out moving. Uh, so. There are different weight options that you can get. This is kind of a mid-weight one. I have some lighter weight ones that I had from cycling. When I used to be a cyclist, I had a bunch of different gear. Uh, because same thing there, you wanna make sure you layer. You don't want just one heavy, 
heavy layer on. And so I would layer, and so I have some that are thinner than this that I will use uh, if it's not quite as cool a day. But this one gets taken quite a bit. Now on those warmer, or on those cooler days when I want to stay warmer, I have something like this big, thick, heavy fleece from North Face. Um, and it's got like the, the thumb hole there on the sleeve just to keep it in place when you're putting on other, other layers. Uh, but this one really does help to keep that warmth in. And so an insulative layer is nice because it is, um, it's just an additional layer. Like I said, you want to make sure you're doing a layering system. You don't just want one heavy jacket over the top because then you're either going to be too hot or you're going to take it off and you're going to be too cold. You put it on while you're hiking and you're going to end up sweating. Now, all of that changes when you get to camp. Once you get to camp, you can throw all of your layers on and stay warm there. You can use your quilt. You can wrap yourself up, bundle yourself in your quilt or your sleeping bag, lay it over your shoulders, wrap it around your body to keep that heat in. But when you're out hiking, you want those layers so that you can stop, shed layers, or grab extra layers if you get cold to regulate the heat. You don't want to sweat and you don't want to be too cold. Next up, let's look at the next layer. Okay, so we had the base layer. We have the stuff that we're actually hiking in. Uh, most of the time I'm not using my base layer while I'm hiking. I'm just hiking in those clothes. If I need something warmer, I will use layers. So first would be like the Patagonia R1 over the top of the shirt that I was hiking in. Then if I'm still cold, I would go to something like this jacket. So this is a little Mountain Hardware 32 degree jacket. Uh, it is a soft fleece. A smooth fleece on the outside, soft fleece on the outside, or in the inside, it's got a little bit of synthetic insulation up top, and it has a hood. I like to have some sort of gear with a hood that can come up and cover my ears while I'm out hiking if I get cold. This one works really well, is really nice, and it's just like the next layer in that system. Now, this is great because it's going to work all year long. Uh, it's kind of a lighter option, but it's just one more layer. Next, if you want to, uh, I know some people like it and some people don't, but I like to have a vest. The vest keeps your core warmer while still letting your arms move and it regulates a little bit more temperature. I have a full zip on it so that I can zip it completely open and just keep a little bit of heat in or I can take it off and remove it, but it keeps my arms from getting too warm. Next up is the Puffy. One of the more versatile pieces of gear that people use is the Puffy. And you have to make a decision and it's gonna depend on your climate. East Coast with a lot of rain, people tend to go with a synthetic because the synthetic, synthetic will keep more insulative properties when wet. People on the East Coast or on the West Coast tend to go more with the downs because there's less risk of wetting. So one of my favorite pieces of gear and one of my most versatile ones is my Ghost Whisperer jacket. This is a 900 fill power uh, down jacket, packs down to nothing about the size of between a baseball and softball, easily packs in your pack, weighs just a few ounces and provides a ton of warmth. If you're afraid of it getting wet, you could go with something like this one, which is still a, a puffy. It's going to provide about the same amount of warmth. It's gonna be a little bit heavier, a little bit less packable, but it's made of a synthetic, a DuPont Clima Shield type of material. And so different options there. But it again, it's all about layering and keeping the right amount of heat in and knowing what you want for your system. Now, once I get to camp, I will have sometimes, depending on the temperature, all this stuff on, or I may actually bring a big puffy. So I've got this one, which is good down to about zero, maybe even less than zero. And when you start combining it with some of the other gear, uh, it really can go down quite a bit cooler and keep you warm. 
The key here though is as you start getting further and further out, make sure that you're buying bigger sizes to accommodate the other gear, the other clothing that you may have on underneath it. So it's a layering system. Make sure that you're accommodating that because what provides warmth is loft, especially when we're talking about the, the downs. The downs do not work well if they don't have that loft. So the loft is key. If you are buying outer layers that are too restrictive, that are not big enough, it won't allow the insulated material to expand, trapping the air inside and keeping you warm. If it compresses it, it really is ineffective and that's not what you want. All right, next layer, let's take a look. All right, next in this system is the rain and wind protection. So it's real important that when you're out there, like I said, you don't wanna get wet from sweat especially in those colder environments, you also don't want to get wet from rain in those colder environments. However, I will say, most of the time, if it's raining in the summer, I do not use a rain jacket at all. I'm going to be wet from sweat or from condensation inside of the rain jacket. So to me, it's better to just actually use it as, as a little bit of a shower and get clean and rinsed off walking through the rain in the summer. Now, you've gotta be careful with it. You've gotta know what the conditions are. If a thunderstorm rolls in, a lot of times the temperature can really plummet and you wanna make sure that things are staying safe. So be aware, know your limitations, know what's going on there, but I don't use a rain jacket most of the time during the summer because I'm going to sweat underneath it more than it's going to protect me from the rain. I do make sure I have spare clothing that I can change into when I get to camp and stay warm and dry under my tarp or in my tent. So let's take a look at what I wear when I do wear a jacket. So when it is colder out, I absolutely love a nice rain jacket. So after a, a trip not too long ago where I absolutely froze using the rain jacket that I normally wear that wet it out. I was on the search for a great option to keep that from happening. And what I found is this Columbia OutDry Titanium. Uh, it is a completely waterproof system. It's got uh, an adjustable hood, it adjusts on the back, it's got drawstrings on the front, it's got a waterproof zipper, it's got a chest pocket. What it does not have it has no pit zips. It has no other way of regulating temperature other than unzipping it. It is fleece lined, as you can see here. It's fleece lined, so it is used for those colder temperatures. And it works great. It, has, uh, it actually has a stretch to it, so it is a little bit more uh, flexible and allows a little bit better movement. But with this OutDry technology that Columbia has come up with, it sheds water extremely well. I have yet to have this one wet out at all. Now for a little bit warmer temperatures, you don't want that fleece line thing and you want something that has pit zips. So I have this anti-gravity gear jacket that I've used for quite a while. This one is made of sil nylon. It does have full pit zips right here. And what this does is it allows you to open up this big opening that runs from about uh, mid bicep to about down here. Um, and it, it allows ventilation, it allows air to come in. You can also unzip the front. Like I said, you're probably gonna get wet from sweat anyway. So I don't use this too much when I'm actually out hiking. What I do use this for is around camp. Once I get to camp and I've changed out of the wet clothes I was hiking in, if I need to go do something such as go get water to filter, I will definitely put this on to stay dry while I'm out doing those things because now I have my dry clothes on and I don't want my dry clothes getting wet. So even if I do say I don't use it while I'm out hiking, I do have a rain jacket with me on almost every trip uh, that I know I can use when I get to camp. And this is the one that I primarily carry. Extremely lightweight, pretty effective, but after hours and hours of prolonged rain, it does wet out. This sil nylon is not perfect. 
and as you wet as you sweat inside it condenses and that's what caused me problems on the one trip that I had a little bit earlier in last year the next thing is wind protection so rain is one thing wind is another they sell jackets that actually are made for protecting you from wind and some of them will have like on this one on the bottom side of the arm it has a mesh that lets it it bent a little bit but blocks the wind they are usually a nylon material the other option you can do is use the rain gear that you're already carrying dual purpose anything you can find in backpacking that is dual purpose is something worth carrying you don't like carrying things that only serve one purpose these pieces of gear not only do they block the rain they block the wind also if you get particularly cold you can put on your rain gear and it acts as a vapor barrier and traps all of your heat inside so effective for an additional layer it can go depending on the size that you have it can go between your your more insulative layers and your midweight layers or it could be just used on the outside to trap it all in so rain gear is multi-use and is something that everyone should carry there are cheaper and and lighter options out there such as frog togs a lot of people use frog togs but you have to be very careful you have to know what type of environment you will be hiking in the problem with frog togs is that they are slightly fragile a couple of branches catching them and they are shredded we saw a couple of people last year when we did the uh, Mount Washington and the the presidential range all through the whites along the AT we saw a couple of people that had absolutely shredded frog togs gear just from the terrain out there so be careful know what you're buying do a little bit of research into it all right what's next let's take a look okay this next section of gear is important it is like the accessory portion so hat all right I wear a baseball cap almost all the time when I'm out backpacking and it is to keep the Sun off of my face if you are in an environment that is more sunny you may want something uh, you could put a bandana or something underneath the back of your hat to protect your neck and your ears uh, you could use a buff uh, I love using buffs buffs you know it comes up around your neck um, out on the Appalachian Trail up through the whites we were in an exposed area and I actually had it pulled up to about here so it was covering my ears and even down over my chin and really protecting my neck my ears from the Sun that was beating down just hammering us all day long uh, the buff is great to sleep in keeps your neck warm and just provides a little bit extra insulation there you can use bandanas for a lot of different things you can use it uh, wet it put it around your neck to keep yourself a little bit cooler while you're out hiking um, you can use it as a pot grabber multiple uses lots of lots of good things there if it gets a little bit colder you may want a fleece hat you know instead of wearing the the baseball cap put on a fleece cap traps in the warmth really nice if it gets a little bit colder than that you could wear a balaclava which is essentially a ski mask you know it's a, a hat and a neck and face piece uh, where really only your eyes are open you can pull it down so your nose is exposed as well and then for those really cold temperatures I love my Scully from UGQ this is a down filled hat a down filled beanie and this thing keeps me super warm uh, for your hands you definitely want a pair of gloves I like a nice lightweight pair of fleece gloves not much more than that is necessary for most of the time I'm out uh, on those really cold winter trips I've got a pair of lobster gloves that I'll wear but for most trips this is all I need lightweight packable easy to carry all right the last piece of gear that we're going to talk about is probably one of the most important and the reason most people dislike hiking and backpacking and that is footwear blisters are horrible so you want to make sure you find the right gear let's take a look at some choices okay so like I said this is probably the most important piece of this entire thing and that's footwear so are you gonna use boots are you gonna use low top hikers are you gonna use trail runners are you gonna use something else 
Uh, there are people that hike in sandals. There are people that hike in uh, Crocs. Yes, Crocs. I actually saw a woman who had hiked a few of the long trails, um, not the Triple Crown ones. The only Triple Crown one that she had done, she had done the entire Appalachian Trail using Crocs. Um, but yes, Crocs. Hey, if you find what works for you, keep with it. So, I started out wearing boots. Uh, the people that I hiked with used boots, and so I used boots. I got blisters all the time. I went to low top hikers, didn't really like them. I went to trail runners, and that's where I started to find the breakthrough. I could go longer, less weight on the foot. The, the ratio that people claim is a pound on the foot is worth five on the back. Whether or not that's completely accurate, I'm not sure, but I will say that going to lighter shoes definitely has an impact on my hiking. The distance I can go, the enjoyability of it. So I am all for trail runners. If you can get away with trail runners, if you don't have huge ankle issues, if you aren't carrying large, heavy packs, I suggest going with trail runners. Now trail runners are definitely not for everybody. Those that are doing more mountaineering, more off trail, more of the extreme stuff may need to look at something with a little bit more stability, a little bit more support. It's again, it goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of this, knowing your adventure, knowing what it is you're gonna be doing and how you're gonna be getting out there. So over the last couple of years, one of the, the shoes that I went to was the Hoka. They have a ton of cushion, as you can see here. The soles are super, super big, uh, which makes them really like you're walking on a cloud. Very, very plush. The downside is they are a little bit higher, and so if you don't have stable ankles, you do have, and I've heard a lot of people saying that they tended to roll their ankles using these. So that's something you can look at there. Uh, but I went away from them because I was still having blister issues. And the blisters I was having were on my heels. So what I have found, and these are what I'm using currently and have been using for a while now, these are Morel Trail Gloves. These are zero drop. Now, there are other companies out there doing Zero Drop as well. Ultra, Morel, Solomon. Uh, there are a couple others that have Zero Drop. What that means is where your heel and your toes are is completely flat. Most running shoes have a higher heel than toe. But when you're walking around barefoot, when the cavemen were out there, did they have a drop on their foot? Was their heel any bigger than it is now? No. And that has been shown through research to be part of the cause of Achilles and calf injuries while out hiking. So, some companies have adopted the zero drop. Now, I've taken it a step further and gone to the barefoot movement. Uh, so these Morels, they're trail gloves. As you can see here, it says barefoot on there. So these ones are minimalist. They have very uh, minimal soles. They're very, very, very flexible and it's almost like wearing a sock. Uh, it is, it's an extremely, extremely flexible, extremely lightweight shoe. I will say, if this is something that you consider, know that you need to train your foot. If you're going from a normal drop to a zero drop, you're gonna need to make sure that you're walking around in it for quite a while before you hit the trail, just to get your foot, get the body mechanics adjusted and used to doing that. And then if you take it a step further and go to the minimalist, you really have to strengthen your feet. If you're gonna do it, one of the best ways to strengthen your feet is start walking around outside on gravel, in the grass, in the dirt, uneven terrain, using barefoot, just going barefoot. It will strengthen the muscles in your foot to the point where when you start using these, you aren't gonna have any problems with your feet. All right, so once you get to camp, I've actually stopped using camp shoes because these are so comfortable, I don't have to take them off once I get to camp. When I was wearing boots or even trail runners, I'd get to camp and want to release my feet, get them out of what I was wearing. And so I would bring something like uh, flip-flops or these sandals. So one of the things I like about these sandals for a camp shoe is that they have a strap that goes around the back so they don't slip off. For quite a while, I had used flip-flops, which were great, but if you're going uphill, they don't work all that well uh, and additionally downhill they don't work too well either these ones have a 
nice tread on the bottom as well. So they have a little bit more purchase when you're out hiking. Now for those colder nights, the colder camps, I like to use these. These are Sierra designs uh, and there are a lot of different ones out there, but they are down booties. And these ones happen to have uh, like a leather sole that has a little bit of a, a harder uh, closed cell foam padding there. So standing on ice or standing on anything cold, it doesn't come up through and get my feet cold. So that's what I use there. So guys, that's what I use for my clothing layering system. Those are the clothes that I most of the time take with me. Now I have others that I will add into the system or take out of the system depending on the weather, depending on where I'm going. And that, as I've said before, is what it's all about. Make sure you are doing this to adjust for the climate, the environment that you will be adventuring in. If you have any existing equipment, any existing gear that you think could work, try it out. Take a look at it. Figure out how you can use it, how you can implement it into the system without having to go out and spend a lot of money and buy. The key here is as a beginner to get out and enjoy it. Use what you've got. Don't spend a ton of money up front. Borrow gear from other people. See what works for you. If you're going to go buy stuff, go try out the cheaper stuff first. See how that works for you. You may find it works absolutely perfectly and you have no need for any of the expensive gear. But the key is getting out, enjoying the outdoors, and trying it. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got something from it. If you have any questions, any comments, go ahead and leave them down below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. There's a little bell icon. Make sure you hit that bell icon so that you get notifications every time we put up one of these videos. This series is going to continue, and I want you guys to be a part of it. Be a part of this. It is interactive, and I want to answer the questions that you guys have, and I will see you down the trail.